it's great to see so many people from around the world. Uh, we have people joining us from the States, from Nairobi, from Switzerland. Someone is from Germany. Um, it's, it shows how connected our world is and probably, yeah, very vital for the talk that we are having today. Um, but before we jump into the talks, we have this lovely group um, from India called Kaputri Colony. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, and they're going to perform for us live. I know most of us are missing live music. I know I am. Um, and why don't we give them a live round of applause? And I, in a minute, I'm going to unmute everyone and we can all clap for them. And VJ will introduce the colony to us. Um, so, <laughs> Hello everyone. Great. So this is Vijay Kumar. I'm from Katpur Colony. We are the colony of magicians, puppeteers, acrobats, snake charmers, painters, and lords. So what I can say is we are living heritage in this country. But this time, I came with our three gems from our colony. One is just sitting close to me, Mr. Puran Bhatt. We can Mashallah. have a round of applause for Puranji. Ooh. He's an excellent award winner, traveled almost all over the world. Let's have a cheer for Puranji. Yay! So now Puranji is going to showcase you one of the modern puppets. A bird with all the movements which he can do through his fingers. Lovely. How real? Where is this flying? In Katputli colony. <laughs> <laughs> तो ये है मेरा कंटेनरी पपेट जो मॉडर्न टेक्निक से बनाया हुआ है और ये मैंने ही बनाया है मैं ही चलाता हूँ उसे सारी चीजें खुद ही बनाते हैं खुद ही चलाते हैं अब मैं आपको अपना राजस्थानी कटपुतली दिखाने जा रहा हूँ जो स्ट्रिंग पपेट सो नाउ दिस वाज द मॉडर्न पपेट व्हिच वी जस्ट सॉ and which we are preserving from last hundreds of the years and this is our main tradition. So now Puranji with his old traditional puppet. So here you go. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
this was our first performance for now we will come back to you this was just a trailer guys thank you so much thank you thank you That is really amazing, Vijay. Um, and just like Vijay mentioned earlier, uh, Kaputli Colony, where Kaputli is um, the word, uh, the Indian word for puppet, um, uh, and they are based in Delhi, and it's home to nearly three thousand artists and their families, including magicians, puppeteers, folk musicians, drummers, and singers and acrobats. And they have performed in streets and traveled around the world. Um, but the pandemic has left them vulnerable and their livelihoods threatened with over 700 to 3,000 artists and their families uh, being identified as extremely vulnerable. Um, this pandemic has hit them during the peak season for their art, um, so usually December to May, and they are now forced to look for basic rations and government um, rations as well instead of spreading hope with their art. Social distancing is impossible in the dense neighborhoods uh, of Anand Pabat, where these families live in a transit camp in rooms as packed as teeth in the mouth. Um, and these amazing artists who are spreading magic with their art, living on the margins in the heat of one of the greatest cities of the world and struggling to find food and livelihood. Um, so we are going to put a link in the, in the chat box for those who can and want to support their art feel free to donate via the link that has been shared in, um, in, the, in the chat box or, uh, just now. Um, and just like all, most of us are wondering what the world will be like for um, puppeteers, for example, um, like, like uh, Kaputli Colony and our own lives as well. Uh, we are faced with a lot of questions like, is the coronavirus going to be the great equalizer? Are we all facing it in the same way and with the same resource? Um, and are we really all in this crisis together? Um, so today we're going to hear from um, inspiring activists from Zimbabwe, India, Kenya, Zambia, um, on how they're viewing the, or the, how they're imagining a world post COVID-19. And this time I'm going to leave this time to Michaela, our host for the day. Michaela? Hi, can you hear me okay? Um, thank you, Craig, for the introduction and thank you to, for the brilliant uh, performance from Kapuli Connolly. Uh, my name's Michaela. I am a community youth worker based in Belfast in the north of Ireland and an Atlantic fellow for social and economic equity. With Craig, I'll be facilitating the conversation today. You're all very welcome to this third edition of Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Conversations around COVID-19. We've had two incredible online events over the past few weeks. First, lockdown is a luxury. Third, insights from activists, policymakers, and practitioners on how lockdown is experienced by communities already suffering in trans social and economic inequalities. Our second event, Solidarity to Justice, discussed social policies and protections during and after the pandemic, including some of the basic income schemes that have emerged in response to COVID-19 crisis. Before I introduce this week's incredible panel of speakers, I'd like to give a brief introduction to my own context as a youth worker in Belfast. Uh, the north of Ireland is governed by the fifth richest economy in the world, Britain. Yet we experience higher levels of multiple deprivation than the British Isles and the South of Ireland. Before COVID-19, over one third of the population were living on or below the breadline. One in three children living in relative poverty. Out of that one in three children, 70% had at least one person in the household in employment, showing the growing number of the working poor and that employment is no longer the solution to the poverty trap. Institutionalized segregation, high levels of deprivation and collective trauma from a brutal conflict has created a mental health crisis here in the North of Ireland with one in three young people experiencing mental health difficulties. 
We have had over 10 years of austerity measures which have cut vital services and only 5.3% of our health budget goes to mental health. We also have a severe shortage of social housing, resulting in 15,000 children living without a home. Publicly owned land zoned for social housing has been privatised to protect the interests of private investors and further the neoliberal project adopted by our government. This context shows that many people were already living in a crisis before COVID-19. State policy has left us vulnerable when facing this pandemic. Inadequate social protection has pushed already marginalised groups to the fringes of society. Unemployment has rose by 90% in the month of April. Claimants for an already shrinking welfare state have gone up by 300%. The already existing feelings of a capitalist state have been exposed and have showed the interlocking systems of power affecting those who are most marginalised in our society. In this dark vacuum that has been created, we have seen social solidarity in the forms of community soup, soup kitchens, mutual aid collectives, campaign groups holding power to account, acts of solidarity and love, which have become a lifeline for many. It is without, without a doubt we will see the lasting impacts of this pandemic for years to come, and these consequences will hit the most vulnerable in our society worse. As activists, we must see this as an opportunity, not to only recenter the margins, but to shift the power paradigms completely so that no one is left behind as we move forward. The resilience, creativity and solidarity of our local communities is something we can hold tight as we ride this storm to a better normal. An ancient Irish proverb, which I think sums up this time that we're facing, states that we all exist in each other's shadow. And on that note, I would like to move on to our speakers and performers for today. We have a fantastic panel, as Craig says, of activists, practitioners, policy makers, creators, and all around just legends from India, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zambia. Each will share their insights on the impact COVID-19 has had on their communities and explore the concept of intersectionality. We will have a reading of a short story from Esther, an Atlantic fellow from Zambia, who's currently based in London, and more performances from the brilliant Caput Blay. We encourage you to ask questions and interact with the speakers as we go using the chat function. We will read through the questions at the end when all three speakers have finished. I'd like to now introduce our first speaker, Asha Kotal. Asha, the former General Secretary of the All Indian Dalit Women's Forum. Asha has been organizing Dalit women's movements in India for the past decade through grassroots campaigning that focus on structural violence against the most marginalized women. She is currently creating the architect for a learning hub that will facilitate cross movement sharing and catalyst for social action. Asha is also a current Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic Equity. My dear friend and brilliant colleague Asha, it's over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Michaela, for that. Um, um, thank you, everyone, for joining this uh, conversation. And uh, a special thanks to the organizers for the commitment and hard work in putting this panel together and uh, inviting me uh, to be part uh, of this. I think all of us have been uh, witnessing uh, really terrible times, uh, whichever part of the world we are in, uh, witnessing misplaced priorities, uh, failed uh, leadership to a large extent, uh, extreme uncertainty and vulnerability for us as individuals and as uh, communities. And I think the fear and anxiety is so deep within uh, each one of us. So I really want to start by, you know, sending love and power to everyone here on, on this uh, uh, call uh, uh, today. And I really wish for strength uh, for every one of us. But diving into this um, uh, conversation, uh, I think I, I really need to start by reflecting for my own self, like how difficult it has been for me to accept to be on this panel to subjectively think about the situation or the plight of my people, uh, to be able to think, to be able to write, and to be able to then share uh, with you all. It has been a really tough uh, uh, journey for me. And I think that difficulty also goes back to a lot of history and context, 
because this is not a new thing for us as a dalit community the community that has been uh, most marginalized and pushed to the i don't know the edges of uh, the fringes of everything possible in this existence whether it's the tsunamis whether it's the cyclones whether it's the earthquakes the floods you name it and we have been as a community bearing the brunt of uh the worst impact of all of these crises so the pandemic is one another in that whole uh, long list uh the compounded impact of it the um, the misery and the suffering uh i don't want to spend my just my precious 10 minutes to talk about the plight of my people i think that would be really incorrect first of all and also almost vulgar in my opinion so the manifold impact of what's going on in the country uh, particularly with those at the uh, communities at the margins is out there and it's also something for us all to read and um, uh, really understand uh, a community of over 260 million uh, uh, erstwhile untouchable people spread across the uh, as a region and the and the world uh, have faced untouchability bondage slavery discrimination for so long and uh, this has only further um, uh, suppressed and uh, uh, increased these vulnerabilities i don't think of exposing uh, structural inequalities but i think what has happened is that it has further reinforced solidified and strengthened uh, the existing uh, uh, hierarchies and the structural inequalities and disparities that have always existed and that is something that is very very clear but what i want to do is that with the limited time that i have i want to speak about three things the first one is i want to really talk about why intersectionality the nice word the trendy word uh, is not okay as an afterthought why an intersectional lens is not okay to be in the footnote or to be as an appendix to something that we are saying something that we are thinking something that we are writing about something that we are analyzing and why it's not okay to be uh, an afterthought and i want to replace that within the context of this uh, pandemic for example in india if you look at all the news you can just google or go on twitter and you will find uh, titles like the migrants uh, walking back to their homes the laborers the daily wage earners the uh, you know domestic workers the construction workers so all of these people are now framed and categorized into these migrant people so it's almost seems like the entire country has already distanced themselves from these migrant uh, laborers um who are they uh, why did they have to come to uh, the uh, why did they have to leave their villages and come here who are the ones who are cleaning the toilets and the sewers in the um, in the urban cities of india who are the ones that have lost their wages who are the ones who are doing the domestic labor who are the ones who were uh, treated as outcasts in their villages and faced extreme violence and had to uh, run away from there so that's why i said that a caste blind approach to this is not helpful it doesn't really uh, uh, help us to understand the context and the history uh, that is behind this large scale uh, tragedy that we are seeing the bigger tragedy to in my opinion is that by doing this uh, somebody or some folks are creating a narrative that they are the migrants they are the workers they are the daily wage workers now the uh, challenge to challenge it to reverse that narrative that is being created that discourse that entire labor is actually then again put us on the marginalized people like for example if you see today or uh, yesterday on twitter the the little girl 15 year old girl who cycled thousands of kilometers with her father on the cycle to go back to her village from delhi is being even for folks from the white house to the parliamentarians in india are actually uh, uh, celebrating it as a feat of endurance of dedication of commitment to the to her father and you know as a cycling record so i have really, really little to say about this morally corrupt society that we are living in who uh, actually thinks that uh, in the face of this crisis that a little girl is actually uh, uh, cycling all the way back home with her father so now the this to challenge that narrative to actually build an alternative discourse to talk about it to expose it all of that labor is again back on on us those people who are already marginalized those people are already uh, uh, oppressed that's why it's not okay that intersectional approaches should be as a afterthought 
thought that you do everything you create everything and then add a little line in the corner saying but of course the marginalized and the most oppressed are the most uh, impacted or they have a compounded or a manifold impact of x y and z and that is completely not okay we are also seeing feminist um, approach a uh, feminist lens to covid 19 even that is very problematic because i know and we all know of many feminists from south asia who are actually writing and speaking about covid-19 without an intersectional lens all women and all genders are not homogeneous they all have a social and economic um uh, a background a history a trajectory and without that without that lens anything that we analyze anything that we write and speak or uh, build upon will be problematic and it will only maintain the status quo so that's why i want to again and again say that as we are talking about centering the margins as we are talking about intersectional approaches as we are talking about vulnerabilities it's not only about us as dalit women who a un report says that we are uh, going to die 14 years before other women so if that is the situation of our health and our livelihood so what will this corona or covid do to us is left for you all to think about this evening but my second point is really about centering the margins the topic of today's conversation now when i think about centering the margins these words are super brilliant they're so beautiful so trendy so fancy i really like it but i start thinking what is it how does it feel like how do, how does how 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 do how do we visualize it how do we touch it and feel the centering of margins does it mean dismantling center dismantling margins up right left right up and down or is it about something creating something di completely different i think that is something all of us really need to think about what it actually means i begin to think of an example of uh, policy making and centering the margins if you take for example the indian government at the center has announced um, you know crores of uh, rupees uh, for the covid 19 but again without an intersectional approach of course the money has gone to all kinds of other nonsense which we are not getting into but if the if the if governments are actually putting aside money for supporting um, uh, people during this crisis uh, bridging the gaps or uh, uh, you know ensuring that certain groups of certain people are safe safe uh, through the safety protection yeah. schemes or the cash transfers or whatever else so without yeah. an intersectional approach we just going to miss the bus completely and then uh, we are going to again reinforce status quo my last yes. point is if bondage slavery um, and all of this is a part of the history then what should be our call for action and i have two things to say if you are an activist a journalist a writer an academician whoever a policy maker whatever you are please ensure that this comes at the beginning of the conversation whatever policy you're creating whatever report you're writing whatever article you're writing that needs to be ensured that this begins the conversation and not at the end of it uh, lastly the aid agencies uh, that are actually putting in their money i would really really strongly recommend uh, civil society networks uh, movements and uh, other activist networks to ensure that you look in your strategy papers that you're creating at this time to ensure that the money goes to the people from the community that not yeah. only ensures that the money is reaching the right place but also really break this representation issue that has lasted for so long finally all our ancestors our foremothers and forefathers have really really faced a lot of struggle and have shown really resilient histories and that's why we are here today to talk to you all like this i'm not romanticizing that resilience uh, and that history of struggle of my people but what i'm saying is that we are looking for genuine solidarity those who are willing to unpack their privilege and entitlement and really stand with us in solidarity shoulder to shoulder so that we can all then cross this uh, terrible terrible crisis together so that it doesn't mean that only those at the center or only those at the margins we can all actually uh, cross this um, crisis together so the question is actually falling back on each one of us who is listening to this are we ready for that kind of uh, solidarity so that we don't only have conversations but we actually make a change and ensure that the status quo is completely broken the narratives are recreated and new history is then uh, created i think my time is up but i'll be really happy yeah. to take uh, more questions and uh, uh, keep this conversation alive uh, through email or through chat or whatever else but i was really thankful for giving me this time
and it was really in a hurry but i'll be really happy to keep talking to people who are interested so thank you all jai bheem bye bye Great. Thank you so much, Asha. Real thought-provoking talk and lots of real key messages coming up there. Um, like Asha has said, we will be taking questions at the end. So any reflections, anybody who wants to engage in this conversation or any questions directly to Asha, please put them in the chat and we'll come back to those. I'd like to now introduce the wonderful Esther, who's going to share her, a short story uh, called Zimbaro. Esther, over to you. Vikuna, Vikuna, Vikuna. Olao woman folk had a song about her. She could hear it every time she closed her eyes. A faint whisper in the wind, mocking her. This time, it was not only in her head. She heard it loud and clear. Di, Kuna. Beli, non. Her anger could not be toward the women. It was not their fault. It could not be their fault. She was the one who was born without a belly button. She was the one whose very own mother had gasped at seeing her first child. B, she had asked the midwife. Belly button? Kuna. The answer had been simple. None. The Kuna did not know the name she was adorned during her naming ceremony, nor could anyone remember. They remembered Bikuna though. They sang it in the streets whenever they saw her. The adults did it in secret, but children could not lie. They sang it aloud and pointed at her in amusement. The mockery their parents had taught them behind closed doors, showing in broad daylight. Some of the children were very bold. They ran to her and tapped at her loincloth to expose the barrenness of her abdomen. Once, a child was so unruly to have left her buttock exposed in the market square, all in an attempt to see her belly. The child's parents had been more brazen and accused Bikuna of immorality. If you don't want your buttocks exposed in the market square, get stronger thread for your loincloth, the child's mother had said. The unruly child's father spat. You spread tails of your fat belly so that small boys will pull at your skirt. You tempt men with your sharp breath when you're no woman at all. Have you no shame? He had leered at her breast when he spoke at her, not to her. Bikuna's husband had said nothing. He had no teeth. An old man of over 80 years, widowed eight times, and yet wealthy enough to marry a will. The ones he married never lived. Some medicine man had promised him Bikuna, saying the 12 year old without a belly button would be auspicious for him. He had kidnapped her on the day she'd left her maternal house, a place she'd been kept for 12 days after her first menstrual bleed. A woman without a womb could bleed. He'd made her bleed again on his mad floor when he'd forced her legs apart and made himself at home inside an ill-prepared soul chamber between her thighs. In the morning, he had paraded her on the streets of Olao and claimed she had seduced him. The woman without a belly was after old men because the young ones did not want her. That had been the tale. It did not matter that he kidnapped her every weekend from then on to save his luck. In the banana plantains, in the cassava fields, down the shortcuts, in the muddy school block by the, dug by the Pearl Fest missionary. In the end, Bikuna believed this was the way of love. Still, her belly remained flat and her breast striped, and he, as before, would never want to be seen with her in public. The medicine man had his way of doing things. He promised the eight-year-old, the one without teeth, the one whose eight wives had died in mysterious death, blotting of the stomach, beaten by a python, madness, dysentery, and suicide. The one who pursued the twin without a belly button. He promised the old man that if he married Bikuna, his misfortune with wives would end. The old man agreed. Barriers were expensive affairs in Olao, and he needed air. None of his eight wives had borne him 
any before their untimely sin life. Not even one sickly girl child spoke truth. None. Kuna. He needed children to carry his name. He married Bikuna, a ninth wife, and now the first. The woman with no womb. He didn't need her womb. He needed that she couldn't die. Therefore, the second wife wouldn't die, and the third. That was what the medicine man had promised. His promise had held. Bikuna had broken the old widow's curse. The second and third wife did not see it that way, though. Bikuna, Bikuna, Bikuna. She heard the song as she approached her hut in the compound. The second and third wife were best friends. They were brought closer by their distaste for her. Their hatred was more intense on nights when their children were blessed in Zindiro River. They sang the song louder. Bikuna, Bikuna. A man can be born without a hand. He would use another. A woman without both hands. She will use her leg. Bikuna, Bikuna. A man without one eye, she would use another. A woman without both eyes, she will use her ear. Bikuna, a woman with no belly. She has no use. Her breast, no milk. Her labia, no strength. Bikuna, useless woman. Bikuna, not even human. Bikuna, Bikuna, Bikuna. Yeah. Wanna unmute everybody if we can show our yeah. There's a link in the chat for Esther has a recently published book with a collection of short stories, so do check it out. Wonderful to have you share that, Esther. Thank you so much. I would now like to introduce our second speaker, Frederick Oko. Fred has worked in disability rights activism for over a decade. He's the founder of Action Network for the Disabled in Kenya. And Fred is also a senior fellow, Atlantic fellow for social and economic equity. Fred, I'd like to pass over to you and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. And uh, for everyone who, uh, who is participating in this call um, and for the organizers. So um, my talk today is more centered around why we need to recenter from the magic. Um, and I'm talking on behalf of persons with disability and issues that surround uh, persons with disability in relation to COVID-19 and usually also about the marginalization that person with disability face within society. I know all of you around here do know a word that has almost become a cliche that nothing about us without us. You've often heard about this. It's talked about when people are talking about women or any group that is marginalized, people are talking about nothing about us without us. But to some extent, this is actually just a cliche because half the time people who say this word do not mean it. Or they're just saying because of convenience or they've, they've had a particular requirement for them to mention that word. So they're saying, oh, we need to include these people because nothing about us without us. But in practice, nothing really is happening in terms of inclusion of those who are actually marginalized. And in this case, persons with disability. I've had a first experience when this pandemic hit us, uh, and I'll speak in terms of Kenya, but also broadly um, in our context, Eastern Africa and in Africa. You will see that all response um, initiatives that were crafted were actually crafted by, you will say, largely people in government and a few social um, partners. So you'll have a World Health Organization. Ministry of Health and a few donor group coming around the table in trying to determine how best do we fight COVID-19. But in my understanding, I know that if you want to find a solution to a problem that is facing a massive population, you actually need to include people who are actually affected by that particular problem. They need to tell you more about the experiences how best are you able to reach out to them in a manner that 
is enriching in a manner that is supportive that they actually can overcome that particular challenge that they are facing. And for these, persons with disability largely in the face of COVID have been ignored both in Kenya and all um, African government. I will say even in the, um, globally, a, a little attention is paid to what are the experiences of persons with disability in relation to say a health pandemic? How do you reach out to them in terms of supporting them so that they are actually are not contracting the disease? They are, you have uh, preventive measures that actually speak to the challenges that they face in life. So it means that our society, and for, for sure, COVID has exposed this in, 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 in many societies around the world, that we are an equal society, globally, locally, in whichever way you look at it. Because if our responses only speak to a particular population and leave out the rest, say in a country, then it speaks to the fact that those that were left out are not counted as part of citizenry of those particular countries. Because what a government should be able to do is to take care of all its citizenry. And how best do you take care of all your citizenry if you don't know the dynamics, if you can't account each and every one of them in terms of their needs and be able to respond to those particular needs. So it means those who are not on the table in terms of structuring the response around COVID are often, or you can assume that those are the people that we want the impact of COVID to affect most in terms of collateral damage because we don't know anything about them. We are not planning towards how we reach out to them. And it's not, it doesn't even appear as a priority in a way, in a way that we plan our responses. And sometimes it's not that people want, but it's just perhaps they don't have information, information that they could have easily gotten if, say, for example, in, in our case in Kenya, when we have a national response committee, if it included an expert who can speak on issues of persons with disability, trying to advise the government on how do you reach out to individuals who have disability in terms of, say, social distancing. How is someone who doesn't, who is not affected by disability, design a social distancing mechanism for someone who needs care assistance every day of his, of his or her life? For example, if I'm a blind, a blind person, uh, perhaps I use a sighted guide. How are you going to separate us, yet I need to move from point A to point B? For example, how am I going to use my walking aid, yet you need me to sanitize it, and I, I cannot afford the sanitizer to be always sanitizing? And perhaps if I'm using public transport, I'm still required to board, say, a vehicle, and definitely I will be touching surfaces on that vehicle because it is not accessible in the first place. Because you and I know that in, in Africa, public transportation is a big issue. And for persons with disabilities, nearly 100% inaccessible for us to get into. For example, if you're using a wheelchair to board a public vehicle to go from point one to point two. So when we are designing uh, social distancing measures, which are good in terms of trying to flatten the curve around uh, COVID um, um, spread. It's only that we, the only thing we forget, which is very little if minute in terms of that response is asking person with disability, how in your case, how will this work in terms of transportation? How will this work in terms of communication? How do we project the messages around um, dist social distancing uh, or doing all these manner of protocols that are meant to really flatten the curve around the spread of um, um, the, the, the virus. So in my view, it, it, it just means that us as a society, as a humanity, sometimes it's, we need to sit back and just look at ourselves and interrogate what are the things that we are doing towards our citizenry. And are we inclusive in, our, in every action that we do? Are we reaching out to every part of, of the society that everyone feels included and they don't feel as a second class citizens within their own countries. Now in Kenya, they've uh, decided that uh, we are going to have an economic stimulus package for small businesses. All of persons with disabilities that I know, majority of them do work in informal, in, in, in informal sector. 
It means they live from hand to mouth. Some of these stimulus will definitely not reach out to them because they're not organized and they're not recognized within the government structures. So again, they're going to lose out. We do not have a proper way that our social protection mechanism are organized that they identify who really need this kind of support and where are they that we can reach out to them so that we try to help them that to mitigate the, um, the effects of COVID-19. But again, in the lack of that, it means, yes, we'll have money released to social protection mechanism within the country, but this money is not going to reach out to them because either people cut corners with them, as, as we always do, and then the actual, the supposed beneficiary will not find that uh, support. And then it means that they are going to be hard hit by the effects of uh, COVID when we are all on the other side of uh, the virus. So really looking at how do we bring this so that it reaches them, it means that we need to look at how do we engage them in all these plans that they are contributing to ways that will support them navigate both um, the short-term effects and medium effects of the, the virus and they are suggesting various ways to, through which we can all support different types of disabilities within within our country. Yeah. For example, persons with disabilities have been agitating for years on how they can work remotely so that we they are able to achieve the objective by working from home. Yeah. It took coronavirus to ensure that everybody is working from home, mm -hmm. that people now can feel the, the challenges that persons with disabilities have been feeling when they go into transportation, yet they cannot access the transport going to work. But now everyone has been allowed to work from home. So it means that it's just an, a matter of equity. Yeah. That if we had, we had supported persons with disabilities to be working from home, we'll actually be experiencing or know their challenges at the point of need. But now we are hoping post COVID that every person with disability who requires a reasonable accommodation will equally get, get it because all of us now, even human resource managers are working from home and now they actually understand. So I, we look at it as perhaps post corona, this is going to be a positive effect yeah. that we are now recentering and looking at person with disability as people can work from home and we have nothing but to feel about if they say we want to work from home. So I'll stop there because my time is through, but then I'll, I'll be more happy to uh, uh, engage in discussion and answer any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. That was some really, really insightful points, sir, and really breaking down the true meaning of, of that often used cliche, nothing about us without us, um, and how that is actually realistically felt um, by people live, living with disabilities. Thank you so much. Once again, if you'd like to respond to any of the speakers or have any questions or any reflections as you hear, please do engage in the chat function and we will um, address any questions that have come up um, after our, our final speaker. Um, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Maureen uh, Zed Kat. Okay, <laughs> I have been, I have been pr practicing the pronunciation of Maureen's surname. Maureen's a social justice and labor activist and organizational change management as, and sustainability consultant in Zimbabwe. Uh, Maureen's also an Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic Equity. Maureen, over to you. We really look forward to your talk. Okay, thanks, Michaela. You actually uh, pronounced it perfectly. You, you know, so thank you for that. Thank you for the team for organizing this talk and much thanks to the people that are joining us and the taking time off their busy schedules to join us and maybe uh, discuss with us the topic of recentering um, the margins. Um, as I'm preparing my slide, let me just uh, give you a preview of uh, the country where, which I call home, which is Zimbabwe, southern, a country that is in the southern part of Africa. So uh, Zimbabwe currently um, has a poverty data line uh, pegged at 6,000 of 100 US dollars, but 80% of the people in Zimbabwe earn far less than 2,500. That means that 80% of those people live in poverty and 54% are in abject or extreme poverty. Um, 
for us, I could relate when Fred was talking that the coronavirus has come at a point where it's just worsening or exposing many years of political economy and social decay. So what this virus has just done is just exacerbate already existing social ills. Um, as I was invited to, to speak on the topic, just hold on, okay, let me Okay, so I was, as I was invited to speak on the topic, um, the first thing that came to mind was, okay, we are recentering margins. So that means that there has to be an, an existing imbalance in society. And I tried the first 15 minutes when I went through the brief, I was like, okay, so many questions and so little responses. I asked myself a lot of questions, some of which included who and what was taking center stage? Who and what was on the margins? And why were they um, related to the margins? What did cause the imbalance that we're now trying to recenter? What needed to be done differently? during the coronavirus and post the coronavirus pandemic. And I also even wondered, must there be a center? Is it correct to say that we should be recentering the margins? Should anything be centered? Should, be, should anything be centered? Or what would rather what would be a mutual reinforcement of entities? And lastly, the one thing that I struggled with, if margins clearly matter, how can their issues be sustainably brought to the table? So again, I then came up with a mental uh, pre presentation to say, so what imbalance if I'm witnessing is a Zimbabwean or someone comes from a very small town called Kwekwe? Hello? Marina, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we're losing you a little bit on the sound. Maybe if you try to take off your own video and we can still. Okay, let me try. I am sorry for the connection. Is. No problem. If you turn off your video, it might come through a little clearer. Okay. Am I, I hope I'm clearer now. Yes, you are. Thank you. And I think we have a copy of your slides. So if we can still sure they don't worry i think we can forego the slide and okay. i think what just happened is the exclusive nature or the some of the effects that i've been experiencing to say everybody's saying work at home connect from where you are but nobody's really looking at the feasibility of the options that are being that are being put on the table and that's exactly what i was trying to say to say what needs to be recentered and how should it be recentered? So in my talk, I'm going, to call, I'm going to continuously refer to community. And as I do so, I'm not going to be talking about community in the context of um, people or a group of people um, who are in a geographical space, but I'm going to be referring metamorphically to community as a, as a grouping of people who share um, values, who share attitudes, who share norms, but also agree on areas of interest as well as action. And I've got, because I know I tend to speak a lot, I've got three key messages that I'm hoping that we were going to get throughout my talk. So I might, I might as well share them now before I get carried away or the network does one on me again. And the three key messages that I want you guys to take away, take away from my talk so that we can engage after that is number one, Community engagement and participation should be the bedrock of all developmental action and strategies in all sectors and spheres of life. Why I'm saying this is that, like Fred had earlier highlighted, what is happening is been, we've been talking about nothing for us without us as a as lip service, but nobody has been living this in, a, in, 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 uh, in the truest sense and form. And the second key message that I want us guys to think about, maybe take away, is that given the historical legacy that we pay, pay lip service to the for us without us mantra, we should have more emphasis that should be paid on community empowerment and resourcing uh, the initiatives with emphasis on the most vulnerable. In this case, the people living with disabilities are very vulnerable and resources should be focused on them. Migrant people, as Asha was talking about, are quite vulnerable and in such in such a case 
resources should be allocated with them in mind to make sure that they're included. And the last key message that I want us to take away and maybe debate over is that the communities themselves, whether you're a group of migrant people, or you're a group of people living with disability, or you are like where I am, a group of people wallowing in the, in the, in the, in the throes of poverty, people, communities need to realize that in spite of the disadvantages and challenges they are faced with, they have an intrinsic ability to carve out organic developmental pathway, pathways that, they work, that work for them. And the past three weeks have given me a beautiful um, wake-up call. So Zimbabwe has been on the, um, under lockdown since the 30th of March, as many I think know by now. Um, and in our lockdown, I shan't, I, shan't, I shan't reinforce or talk about it again to say the effects of the lockdown on people who are in the informal sector have been devastating. For those people that were precariously employed, it means that they've lost quite a number of their earnings per month and that has made their survival quite a struggle. I'm not going to focus on that today. But what I'm going to talk about is an experience that showed me that communities indeed do have powers, they might be disadvantaged, but they can carve out uh, developmental pathways that work for them. So you can imagine I stay in a small town called Kwekwe and most of my neighbors are either vendors or they are they, they pride their trades in, as artisanal uh, miners. So on the 5th of May, school, schools were supposed to open, but uh, this has not been so because of the coronavirus. And it makes sense though, because the health and uh, safety of our children is of utmost importance. But what has been happening since the 5th is that there's been conversations around alternative education um, or learning platforms for children. And one such popular alternative has been e-learning. Um, I'm, I'm quite privileged also to play uh, with, to hang out with a, a number of privileged people despite where I come from. And I know that I've got friends whose children have got easy access to e-learning platforms. But the case, that is not the case for um, Mbizo, the, the, the township that I come from. And because of that reality, a couple of young women, old women got together sweeping just as a conversation as we had known, as we had become, as, as it had become known for us in the past couple of weeks. We, we started talking and asking ourselves, what can we do? Our kids were being left behind whilst the kids of those people that have resources were continuing with learning on, on, on internet platforms. As a result, um, an idea of community collective homeschooling came to. What this uh, initiative means is that we, we pull in our resources. Whoever has got a textbook shares the textbook with another person. We look for technical people like teachers who can, um, who can help us teach our children or homeschool our children. And um, we try to do that in the safest possible manner, observing the WHO guidelines of safety around coronavirus. As I speak today, our school, homeschool in courts, I wish you could see me doing the courts thing, but our school opened on the 5th, you know. And what we did is we had three volunteer teachers who volunteered their services free of charge because they merely stay in my street. And we've got parents who said, you know what, we've got space. I've got an extra room in my house. It might not be the, the, the Hilton Hotel or anything, but it can be used for a school. We yeah. have parents who said, I can donate sanitizer. I can make, um, I can make masks for you for free. And from then, our children started going to school. Share, textbooks are shared. I'm sure um, the host team is going to share a link to a blog that I shared with yeah. photos of exactly what is happening. But what that whole story is teaching me, now that we're sitting at 86 children who are being schooled using our alternative community homeschool initiative, is that yeah. communities, albeit the disadvantages and the challenges that they face, can be creative and innovative and come up with developmental pathways that work for them. I'm not going to romanticize this and make it seem like it's easy because it hasn't been easy. It yeah. continues not to be easy in a community where we're trying to look for livelihoods options, but at the same time trying to school our children. So it's by no means not easy. But what I do know as I speak to you is that it's doable. Right. Yeah. And um, I would have loved to show you photos of uh, what has been happening. It's been heartwarming. The feedback has been 
phenomenal. And the effects have not just been educating our children, the effects have grown and spilled over to the community itself. We are more cohesive. We, I talk to my neighbors more because I used to be that person who just comes to your hometown and you do your thing and you go back and you don't say hi to anybody. But we've, we've now encouraged this and there's a deeper sense of belonging with the, within the communities. So much that people that are now starting to see other options to which we can um, as a community come together and try and solve our yeah. issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in before, I would have also loved to show you the teacher who's sitting right next to me. He's unemployed. He hasn't. He hasn't. He, he's since qualified as a teacher a couple of week, a couple of years ago, but he has he has volunteered his expertise, and that shows me that we do have expertise. It's a matter of how do we harness that? How do what is the value proposition in all of that? But at the end of the day, Fred, when you say it should be nothing for us without us. We, those people that are marginalized should also take, stand up and, and make sure that they take center stage and not be comfortable within, with being pushed to the per peripheries. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me the call of action, I've got um, three call, four calls of action for two very important constituencies that I've been talking about. The first one is um, on uh, our policymakers and the government. And I'm also sure if other participants here are going to resonate with my call to action and we can talk about that again. <laughs> but my first point of call to government will be, I think COVID-19 has taught that we should no longer, we should stop paying lip service to community people-centered approaches just because we want to tap into certain resources. In fact, uh, policymakers should understand that it's very important, particularly when you're managing a crisis, for communities to be engaged, for community interventions to always be um, to always be flagged out, so that when crises come like this and government and policies are inadequate to ensure health and safety for all, yeah. communities can stand up. So my first point of call to government is governments should tune into and support community bread and community delivery initiatives. The second thing that government needs to do is actively invest in creating environments that encourage and enable uh, community initiatives to grow. So I'm going to tell you that just yesterday, we had uh, police officers come to the school in courts because we still don't know what this is. Um, and they, 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 I wasn't there, but they harassed one of the community members who offered space to the teachers. And I'm thinking, if this is such a good initiative that is enabling every child to, to, to be able to continue learning, what, the government should support such an initiative by making sure that even the policy environment enables such an initiative to grow. Because in a repressive, if the policy environment is not inclusive or does not allow uh, the, the organic germ germination of initiatives bred from the community to grow, they're just going to die a natural death. Yeah. So it's important yeah. for, for governments to create an environment that supports community initiatives like the one I feel my community is onto because we have had success over the three weeks that I wish we we're going to continue to record. And then my second call, of action, call to action is going to, to the communities themselves. Fred and Asha, I, I, I share your feelings when you were saying that we've been relegated, the migrant, migrant um, communities have been relegated to the peripheries. But I also feel that it's time that organic leadership comes out of communities that are marginalized and we stand up and rise up and push back. So what my community is doing is that they're saying, okay, so the government is not going to do anything anytime soon, but we are going to do something about it. And the result is that 86 children who are so poor enough to tap into e-learning platforms are getting an education, irregardless of the fact that our government did not have a clue how to make, it, make their alternatives inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. And the last yeah. thing that communities need to do, I know I might be running out of time, am I? Yeah, <laughs> is, yeah, we uh, have to finish up. So Maureen, but your last point would be great to hear. My last point is that our communities should also appreciate the fact that there should be spaces where organic leadership should grow, you know, because as part of recentering the margins, we also need to reorient and refigure leadership. Because what I've noticed right now in the country of Zimbabwe is that we have a crisis of leadership as well. 
And perhaps the crisis emanated from the fact that our communities have not been active participants in breeding the kind of leaders they want. So communities should be grounds where organic leadership who are attached and aware to the lived realities and the inadequacies of the most vulnerable people of the communities face. So the community should play an active part in breeding the kind of leadership that they want. Um, we can discuss this further, and I'm sure Karen is going to refer to a number of writings that I've made, but I would love to yeah. discuss more about it. And thank you guys for allowing me to talk about this for the past 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Brilliant. Amazing, Maureen. Thank you so much. That, that was incredibly inspiring and, and left us, I know myself, feeling with a, a lot of hope, um, which is, is very, very important too. Uh, we are pushed for time and I really do apologise. We're running a little bit over, but the, the speakers and performances have been so strong this week. So hopefully if people are able to stick around a little bit after our, our scheduled time um, of, of 4.30 UK time, um, we, we can run over a little bit with, with questions. Please do um, put any questions or reflections that you have in the chat. We will be sharing Maureen's slides that you didn't get to see, um, and we've already shared the blog that Maureen did with, with pictures that she was referring to there. Um, I'd like to now welcome back uh, Kaputa. To, 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 to give us one, one more performance um, while we gather our questions together and we'll be going back to the this, this speakers then. So, uh, DJ, are you there? If I can hand over to you guys. What a dialogue. Whoa. It was amazing hearing you, all you guys, and I was keep listening. Yeah. And Asha, and the story was beautiful. Thank you so much, guys. So again, we are here, like with our second performance, introducing Mahender with flute and the Rahul on Dholki. So now I am not going to waste any more second. I am presenting Mahender and Rahul.
Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. We'll have one final performance just before we end. Uh, right now, we're going to address some of your questions that have been coming in, uh, which, which have been great. Thank, thank you for that. And um, all speakers have said also that they can't be contacted privately as well if anyone wants to carry on the conversation uh, beyond this event here today. So our first question goes to Fred or any of the speakers, inspired by Maureen's call for action. In the medium term, rather than major systems overhaul or intermediate humanitarian response, what can be done by local government or community organizations to support those working in the informal economy? So the question was addressed to Fred or any of the other speakers. So if all speakers want to unmute themselves and whoever feels like they'd like to respond to that, what can be done in the medium term by local government uh, community response? Um, thank you. Um, I think this was a question from Saida. Um, for me, what can be done in the short term, uh, especially focusing on the informal, um, informal economy or, uh, or women working from this um, formal sector is for government to have measures that directly target them and especially for local government because these are people who actually depend on, um, say, small-scale trade to feed their family, and especially women are the ones caring for the family, the kids are depending on them, are running a household. So it means in the event that they cannot go out to um, work or even do the small-scale businesses, it has actually hit on them that they cannot provide for their kids. And the, uh, the lockdown or curfews also exacerbate that. So it means that they are at a very precarious, uh, precarious situation that actually need an intervention for a short term. So for example, if there's any um, cash transfers, these are the people that are supposed to be on the priority list. So because they, it is not only going to them, but it's helping our whole family in terms of how do they navigate um, the current uh, pandemic. Um, uh, Michaela, can I pick up from Fred? Absolutely, yes, go for it. So, thanks, Saida. This is a question that my street has been grappling with because remember, like I told you, most people are informal traders. And I agree with you, Fred, but I think the first thing that needs to be done as soon as possible, given the fact that players in the informal economy were not organized, is for the informal traders to organize themselves virtually because I know whether virtually or using the spaces, uh, maybe where they stay, but they need to be organized, should find and be able to reach to them because the assumption that we're having when we say government should then reach to reach them when there is is that they is they are organized but they are not organized so the informal traders themselves number one need to organize themselves so that um, when there are government interventions or aid agencies, the aid agencies that would want to help, they can um, be able, they can be better placed to get access to them. And I think the other thing in the Zimbabwean context um, that I got was that there is everything is centralized to the, to the government, so much that municipalities and local governments cannot do anything. So another thing that needs to happen immediately is the devol devolution of powers from the central government into district or ward level um, uh, constituencies, smaller bites of communities, so that if there's interventions, they can be done at that lower level. But in the case of Zimbabwe, everything is centered around around Harare where the executive sits and law municipalities are really disempowered because everything is centered around this. So decentralization needs to follow and with it the aid agencies can come in as well and tap into the organized informal uh, traders and this goes beyond women cider and I think it also applies to men because there are a number of men prying their trade informally in Zimbabwe as well. 
I just want to quickly add what, just one sentence, um, uh, Michaela. Uh, I uh, completely agree with what Maureen has said. In India, we actually have a very beautiful decentralized local self-governance, the panchayats at the, uh, at the local level. And uh, I'm actually right now in Kerala, and a lot has been written and said about the model uh, that how Kerala has responded to uh, COVID-19 or something worth uh, looking at as well. But I, I also wanted to add this one point is that that the, uh, with the decentralization and particularly fiscal decentralization and devolution of powers, uh, it's much easier for accountability. And I think defenders and other activists, community leaders uh, who are actively organizing communities, perhaps in the next phase of their work, would look at how they're demanding accountability from the system in terms of allocations, in terms of dispersals of this monies that have been uh, set aside for particular schemes, not just for the informal um, uh, sector, but uh, all other social protection schemes. So I think it's important that uh, local self-governance and the um, community leaders uh, work uh, together, of course, with the aid agencies and other uh, uh, monies that is flowing in from the government as well. I think that would be critical in the next coming months. Uh, and just to add on to what Asha said, I think something that we have to keep in mind as well is the human dignity of the recipients when money is being transferred from perhaps the government or the aid agency to the grassroots. It's important that it's done in a way that it's not used for publicity stunts, but rather to help people and offer long-term solutions because the current crisis is just showing inequalities that already existed and these are structural. So even the aid that's being given for COVID should not only be short term, but also should be, we should have a long term insight on what it looks like post the pandemic so that people don't just go back to, to the way it was before because that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for that. I think we maybe have time for one more question before we finish off with our, our final performance. Um, a lot has been covered in what you guys just, just answered there. So I'll skip on to a question for all um, asking, do the margins matter? Or is it that we have become so, they have become so invisible that we forget that society's reproduction actually depends on their work? That's addressed to any speaker who wants to take that one. Do the just, margins matter? Yeah, I'll just jump on quickly on that one and say um, there is an issue of meritocracy where people feel like if you're poor, it's your fault. And if you're poor, you didn't work hard enough. If you're sick, you, you're not eating healthy. And putting the responsibility on the individual uh, to to sort themselves out and that's really something that the nature of a capitalist world where people are competing for resources instead of looking out for each other. Uh, so the margins do exist, but they're a function of the society we live in. And if we are to break that hierarchy and just say we are all human, we're all equal and change our perception of meritocracy, then I feel like the margin shouldn't exist at all. But in the current economic system, in the globalized capitalist neoliberal system, yeah. So I'll just say that. Thank you, Esther. Anyone? Um, yeah. I also want to agree. I mean, I, I don't think it's up for questioning that the margins matter because I think um, riding on the sustainable development goals, the whole reason why institutions, governance and policies exist is to save the margins, informed by what the margins need and want. So I think they undoubtedly matter. But I also want to acknowledge the fact that there are structural impediments in the place that has renegated uh, these margins to the peripheries. But Esther, I, I also agree with the fact that the capitalist model is such that it pushes you to the margin. But my experience for the past three weeks has, has, has taught me because I've been, I'm, we are still under the capitalist model, but there is a community that is schooling its own 86 children under the same capitalist model. So it also gives me like to say, in spite of the structural challenges, communities, if they do come together, 
you know, and, and plan together, collectively pull in resources, channel out their energies to reach out to those people that want to help, they can make a change because nothing has changed in Zimbabwe. But what I've seen in the past three weeks has been phenomenal. A community has schooled its own children in a way that has never happened before. So I think it is, it is possible, difficult, yes, but very possible for them to stand up for themselves. Brilliant. That's great. Guys, I, w I want to, as much as we can continue on this very, very inspiring, uh, really incredible discussion today, we do have to draw to a close and we have one more performance um, we, which is going to play us out and, and leave, leave us in, in uh, such a, a happy mood, hopefully that we can take forth and back into our own communities. There's information in the chat box about how you can, how we're going to develop this, these conversations and and continue these questions going. I'm sorry we didn't get all questions um, answered, but all of the speakers are up for, for private conversation, so please do make use of that. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody again, and if you could please just join me in a very warm applause and, and thank you to all of our speakers and performers today. It's been absolutely incredible. <laughs> VJ, are you guys ready for your last performance? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Yay, now. thank you. So, now we are ready with our final performance. First of all, I really want to thank, let me adjust the screen, guys. <laughs> so first of all, I really want to thank uh, the whole Atlantic fellows, Priyanka and everyone. And now we are coming with our performances and I really want you guys to dance, you know. I really want you guys to dance now. So let's start with Indian Wedding, presenting the Indian Wedding Rockers, this band who performed almost all over the world, who is headed by Vinod Bhatt, presenting the Indian Wedding Rockers, guys. Woo! I'm Vinod Bhatt. This is my team.
thank you so much for watching us and thank you for this beautiful opportunity now we have to close our session because uh, it's a lockdown and we can't like bring lot of people together thank you so much yeah thank you thank you everyone yeah.